Mars? No, it would be wiser to settle the moon first. No matter how far along society has gotten, it will eventually run across a challenge that is difficult to overcome. What is it? Because of the limited resources on our world, the quantity of space that is available is something even more basic and constricting than commodities like minerals, pure water, and breathable air. On our globe, there is actually a limited quantity of land available for habitation. Yes, it's possible that eventually we may create floating cities on the oceans or perhaps find a way to survive deep underwater, but it's only a matter of time before we have to abandon the planet in part. Okay, but where are we going? It is pointless to consider the idealistic notion of looking for a flawless extrasolar planet that is already pleasant and habitable at this time. The distances are too great, and we don't have nearly enough technological resources to complete such a project. Therefore, it appears that the only way we can create a world that is fit for human life is to make a planet that is currently inhospitable habitable. And this process is known as terraforming, a word that, to the general public, conjures only one image, Mars. But although while many people think that Mars is the best planet in our solar system to terraform, there might be a more accessible choice that is even better, the Moon. I'll also discuss the universal desire to visit Mars. First impressions may lead one to believe that Mars is a much better candidate for terraforming and settlement than the Moon. After all, Mars already contains a lot of water, both in the solid and gaseous states. So it is mentioned, but I myself worry that the forecasts in this area are overly hopeful. Additionally, Mars is bigger and heavier than the Moon, it has twice the gravitational pull, and, despite having a rarefied atmosphere, it has a high carbon dioxide content. All of those are deemed to be superior to what the Moon can provide. But while Mars has merits, it also has a lot of problems. Here are a couple. For starters, it is further away from the Sun than Earth is, thus the typical amount of sunlight that reaches its surface is only 40% of what it is here. And that doesn't even take into account dust storms, which on the red planet can block solar energy for weeks or even months at a time. And with less solar energy, we will need to make arrangements for artificial light and heat sources to be used in addition to it while we are there. And it will need the relocation of complicated equipment, machinery, and installations over vast distances. Mars is vulnerable to solar wind particle bombardment because it lacks a protective magnetic field like Earth does. Living on the surface would entail absorbing a deadly amount of radiation over timescales that are incredibly, incredibly short compared to human life. Due to this, it would be necessary to relocate below, possibly to one of those massive lava tubes that appear to be abundantly distributed throughout the red planet's subsurface. Fair enough, the moon is also impacted by this issue. The soil issue is yet another serious one. The Martian soil is actually very different from that of Earth because it contains silicon dioxide along with metals that have been heavily oxidized, including iron oxide, aluminum oxide, calcium oxide, and sulfur oxide. This makes the soil extremely hostile and has a chemistry that is actually very unfavorable to the presence of organic compounds and the growth of plants. One-way communications from Earth to Mars can take anywhere between 7 and 22 minutes to arrive because to the distance between the two planets. If you have to control any operation from Earth in real time, it will take a very lengthy time. The threats to human life must also be taken into account. Similar to the Apollo period, a one-way trip to the Moon only takes a few days. Astronauts may easily return to Earth in the event of an emergency because a spacecraft can travel 400,000 kilometers in just three days. On the other hand, Mars is hundreds of millions of kilometers away from Earth, a thousand times farther than the Moon, so it would take a manned mission six to eight months to travel there. The team might decide to stay on Mars if there were an emergency. Not to mention the significantly increased costs associated with moving supplies. Naturally, none of these issues pose an insurmountable challenge. 
Virtually anything is feasible with a significant enough resource expenditure, including establishing bases on Pluto. However, your task becomes more challenging the more resources you need to bring with you in order to both survive and prosper in the new environment and to shield yourself from the negative impacts of everything around you. What about the moon, though? There truly isn't much competition in terms of infrastructure and accessibility, though. The 1.2 second telecommunications delay does not interfere with regular voice and video chats. In the early stages of colony establishment, when urgent issues might require aid from Earth in almost real time, this could be extremely important. Earth seems huge and always visible on the near side of the moon, but when it is seen on Mars, it appears as a star. A lunar colony's crew would experience psychological closeness to Earth less frequently. An astronomical observatory would be ideally situated on a lunar base. The moon rotates slowly, thus observations in visible light may extend for several days. A number of observatories placed all around the lunar surface might similarly be used to maintain a target under constant surveillance. Because of the moon's low gravity, a radio telescope there may be far bigger than the one at Arecibo. The moon is also geologically dormant, which, along with the lack of significant human activity, almost eliminates mechanical vibration disturbances and increases the effectiveness of interferometry. Last but not least, it should be remembered that the moon may contain rich deposits of minerals that are both uncommon on Earth, such as titanium, gold, palladium, iridium, and uranium, and common minerals such as iron, nickel, and aluminum, as many meteorites, asteroid clusters, or comets that are known to be abundant in these minerals arrive on its surface almost intact due to the lack of atmosphere on the lunar expanse. Additionally, the discovery of helium-3 on the moon, which nuclear fusion power plants may use, would increase the possibility of delivering electricity for lunar bases and or cities to both Earth and the moon. No atmosphere, clouds, or sandstorms exist on the moon to filter or obstruct solar radiation. The solar panels would only require cleaning every few decades and could be installed on the surface to receive the same amount of incident radiation as an orbiter. An effective means of transit between Earth and the Moon, as well as later between the Moon and other locations in interplanetary space, will be necessary for a lunar outpost. Our spacecraft has the benefit of a relatively weak gravitational field, making it simple to launch items to Earth and other places. However, it would be quite expensive to send things from Earth directly to Mars. The Moon's best resource, though, is something that transports us to the past, not the future. As we have already established, the oxide-rich Martian soil is unsuitable for cultivating the plants required for the early colony food source. However, the Moon and Earth share a common past in terms of the elements that make up both worlds, the chemical makeup of the compounds we discover, and the isotopic ratios of the components present. The lunar regolith's composition is exactly the same as that of Earth's crust, with the exception of the organic elements present in soil. And if the material on the Moon is not only similar, but also the same as the stuff on Earth, terraforming the Moon becomes a far simpler operation than we might have initially thought. The process of lunar agriculture can be started by simply breaking lunar rocks to create soil. And just recently, regolith from the Apollo 11, 12, and 17 missions was utilized in an experiment to sow seeds of Arabidopsis thaliana, a plant with little agronomic significance but which is frequently employed as a model organism in numerous scientific experiments due to its simplicity. Due to the limited amount of lunar dirt that was accessible, as well as its immeasurable historical and scientific significance, the intended experiment had to be carried out on a tiny scale while being continuously videotaped and observed. The regolith was put into tiny thimble-sized plastic containers that are typically used for cell cultivation. Every one of them worked nicely as a jar and held roughly one gram of regolith. The researchers put some Arabidopsis seeds to the soil after moistening it with a fertilizer solution, much as they would when trying to grow something on Earth. 
As a comparison, some seeds were also planted in soil made from earth, but it was fake lunar soil, simulated Martian soil, and soil from harsh settings on earth. The outcome? Well, almost all of the samples resulted in seedlings, proving that a lunar colony could be supported by simply cultivating a lot of plant products in a greenhouse. In other words, we must surely land on the moon first if our goal is to inhabit and subsequently terraform the most appropriate planets in the solar system. And even if we were to attempt to land on Mars in the first place just to show off our powers, we would probably still do it since we would instantly revert to the more prudent approach of a peaceful and comfortable colonization of our satellite, I'm confident that a voyage to the red planet would stay exceptional for a considerable amount of time. After all, we would only need to move forward in a series of sequential and modular steps with a repeating pattern that would eventually become a tried and true routine, pressurizing domes or even lava tubes, installing massive greenhouses, calmly building the necessary infrastructure to connect the first small communities, securing the production of an increasing amount of energy, solar or nuclear. One tile at a time, without hurrying but methodically. Finally, we will be able to use the moon as a stepping stone to colonize the rest of the solar system when we are robust and well-suited to harsh settings.